Welcome to the BC Technical Webinar Series. We will discuss accreditation in nuclear medicine. Today's webinar session is worth 1.5 voice credits. In order to receive these credits, you must complete the online test, which will be available immediately after this webinar. A passing score of 80% is required for the voice credits to be awarded. You may take the test more than once if need be. A certificate will be emailed to you at the close of this webinar and following successful completion of the online test. Please keep the certificate as proof of your completion of this webinar. United Healthcare first required nuclear cardiology accreditation in 2008 in order to qualify for medical reimbursement. Congress then enacted the Medicare Improvements for Patients and Providers Act in 2008, which is also known as MIPA, which went into full effect on January 1, 2012. MIPA requires labs that bill for the technical component of advanced diagnostic exams, CT, MRI, nuclear medicine, and PET under Part B of the Medicare to be fully accredited by one of the three accreditation organizations known as the ACR, ICANL, or the Joint Commission. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services will not issue payments to laboratories with under review or provisional accreditation statuses. You must maintain accreditation at all times. Any interruption in full accreditation status can now lead to a near total loss of revenue. There are several accreditation options. The Joint Commission on Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations, or now known as Joint Commission, is the largest U.S. hospital accreditation organization. Preparing for a Joint Commission survey is a challenging process for any healthcare provider, as it must examine its current processes policies, and procedures relative to the current standards of care and prepare to improve any areas that are not currently in compliance. Healthcare organizations who use Joint Commission usually hire a consultant who is an expert in the Joint Commission application processes. The process of securing accreditation for a non-hospital nuclear lab can be somewhat daunting. The Joint Commission accredits entire facilities only, so if you have a nuclear lab in a cardiology practice, you would have to accredit the entire cardiology practice, not just the nuclear lab. Base prices for accreditation are listed here. The Joint Commission is also the most expensive option, costing $10,335 for three years, if your facility has under 5,000 visits per year. For a single-camera nuclear lab, ACR accreditation will cost you $3,392, including a small spec phantom plus medical physicist fees. For a single camera nuclear cardiology lab, ICANL accreditation will cost you $3,300. The ACR nuclear medicine accreditation requirements are relatively short and straightforward. If you are already tied into a radiology practice, you probably have all of the pieces in place to relatively easily secure accreditation from them.
The ACR is highly focused on the quality of your cameras and images. They require the use of an imaging phantom, extensive involvement by a medical physicist for your application images, and quality assurance studies about the consistency of interpretation between interpreting physicians. The ACR application process is on a tight timetable. You must submit all application materials within 45 days of requesting the application itself. The application is in paper format or can be done entirely online. For a single camera nuclear lab, ACR accreditation will cost you $3,392, including a small spec phantom, plus medical physicist fees. The application for accreditation in the Diagnostic Modality Accreditation Program is a two-step process. You must provide the ACR with information regarding your practice site characteristics, meaning your personnel, and modality-specific information, including the equipment. A practice site is defined as each different geographical location where imaging is performed. Secondly, you must submit clinical images, depending on the specific modality, scanning protocols, patient reports, phantom images, and dose measurements. The timetable for ACR submissions is as follows. All testing materials must be submitted to the ACR within 45 calendar days from the date sent or the application. Completed renewal information should be returned to the ACR within 60 calendar days from the date sent in order to avoid delays in the accreditation process and possible expiration prior to accreditation. Materials submitted after a deficiency must be dated within 15 days of the notification. The Nuclear Medicine Accreditation Program involves the acquisition of clinical and phantom images and corresponding data for each unit. The acquisition of the phantom images involves the use of a designated SPECT phantom. Accreditation in nuclear medicine is unit-based. Every unit used to produce diagnostic clinical images for patients must successfully pass accreditation testing in order for the facility to be accredited. Facilities are able to choose from one or more of the three modules for accreditation. Module 1 is General Nuclear Medicine, Planar Imaging. Module 2 is SPECT, Single Photon Emission Computed Tomography. Module 3 is Nuclear Cardiology Imaging. The facility must apply for all modules that are performed at the site, as well as all isotopes used on each unit. Information will be collected on the quality control and the quality assurance programs in place, follow-up procedures, data collection, reporting, radiopharmaceutical procedures, and laboratory safety. Each facility must have a process in place for all patients to obtain copies of their records and images that are HIPAA compliant. Patients should be made aware of this process at the time of examination or if requested by the patient at a later date.
Each facility must have a procedure for documenting the qualifications of the facility's personnel from the primary source when appropriate for licenses and certifications. All facilities must make publicly available a notification for patients, family members, or consumers that they may file a written complaint with the ACR. All technologists performing nuclear medicine exams must meet the minimum criteria in the table below. The ACR recommends that technologists be certified and actively registered in the modality they perform. Initial requirements for nuclear medicine technologists are ARRT or NMTCB registered or have the equivalent state license for nuclear medicine technology. This is the table referenced in the previous slide. This chart outlines the initial requirements, as well as the continuing education that must be obtained annually for nuclear medicine technologists. Nuclear medicine technologists must satisfy all applicable state and federal regulations, as well as any institutional policies that pertain to the use of in vivo radiopharmaceuticals, the performance of imaging procedures, and the safe handling of radioactive materials. Nuclear medicine technologists must have a knowledge of radiation safety and protection, the handling of radiopharmaceuticals, all aspects of performing examinations, operation of the equipment, handling of medical and radioactive waste, patient safety, and applicable rules and regulations. Performance testing reviewed by a physicist must be performed at least annually, beginning with intrinsic uniformity. This is performed to ensure that the intrinsic detector integral and differential uniformity are sufficient to minimize the production of artifacts. This will ensure that the patient abnormalities can be visualized without interference from the imaging system. System uniformity is performed to check all commonly used collimators for defects that might produce artifacts in planar and tomographic studies. Intrinsic or system spatial resolution is performed to ensure that the detector resolution is sufficient to provide satisfactory detection of lesions and delineate detail in clinical images. Relative sensitivity is performed to verify that the count rate per time between the two heads is within 5%. Energy resolution is performed to verify that the scatter rejection is sufficient to provide optimal contrast in clinical studies. On some systems, Energy resolution is very difficult to measure, specifically on older equipment. Count rate parameters are performed to ensure that the time to process an event is sufficient to maintain spatial resolution and uniformity in clinical images acquired at high count rates. Formatters and video displays are tested to ensure that systems used to produce hard copy and monitors that are used for interpretation of clinical studies provide satisfactory image quality 
in terms of uniformity and spatial resolution. The overall system performance for SPECT systems is performed to quantitatively verify that SPECT systems provide satisfactory tomographic uniformity, contrast, and spatial resolution. System interlock tests are performed to verify that all system interlocks are operating as designed and that the system is safe and reliable for the nuclear medicine technologist to operate and for imaging patients. Dose calibrator accuracy testing is done annually to verify that the readings from this instrument are accurate. All basic measurements of performance must be done at the time of installation and repeated after major repair. Dose calibrators are tested for the following. Battery voltage, zero adjustment, background adjustment, accuracy, which is performed with a National Institute of Standards and Technology traceable source, linearity, and constancy. Thyroid uptake and counting systems. These are tested to verify energy calibration, energy linearity, energy resolution, sensitivity, and reliability, which is a chi-squared test for the measurement of organ function and the assay of patient samples. Thyroid uptake and counting systems are tested with the I-123 capsule, or long-lived standard calibration check. Background, high voltage and gain checks, energy resolution, and chi-square. Nuclear medicine technologists are required to perform quality control tests. Intrinsic or system uniformity is performed each day of use and this will verify that the components are properly functioning and provide a uniform image in response to a uniform flux of radiation. Intrinsic or system spatial resolution is checked weekly, performed to quantitatively verify that detector spatial resolution is satisfactory for clinical imaging. It is required that center of rotation be tested at least monthly, but it is usually done on a weekly basis. It is performed to maintain the ability to resolve details in clinical spec studies. High count floods for uniformity correction are done as recommended by a qualified medical physicist, and they are performed to correct for residual detector and collimator non-uniformity and to minimize the production of artifacts in clinical studies. Overall system performance for SPECT systems must be done semi-annually. Quarterly is actually recommended. This is performed to qualitatively verify that the system has maintained its capabilities with respect to tomographic uniformity, contrast, and spatial resolution that maximize the benefit in clinical studies. Technesium must be done at least semi-annually. Other radionuclides may be tested on alternate quarters. Quality control on dose calibrators is performed daily, quarterly, and semi-annually. 
Daily tests are performed to verify that the calibrator is accurate and reliable for the assay of doses administered to patients. Quarterly, a linearity test must be performed to document that accurate readings are provided throughout the entire range of activities used clinically. Semi-annually, all non-exempt radionuclide sources must be tested to verify that radioactivity is not leaking from the sources. And survey meters must be calibrated annually. Thyroid uptake and counting systems are tested each day of use. Standards are measured to verify energy calibration and sensitivity for the measurement of organ function and the assay of patient samples. A SPECT phantom is required for ACR testing. A facility may choose to purchase a phantom or have it brought in by a medical physicist for use. Planar and SPECT images must be obtained and submitted for review using the phantom that has been approved by the ACR Committee on Nuclear Medicine Accreditation. The ACR approved SPECT phantom is commonly used for quality control in nuclear medicine. For cameras that are used to perform planar and SPECT imaging studies, an ACR-approved phantom must be used for evaluating planar and tomographic image quality. This is an example of a SPECT phantom, commonly called a JZAC phantom, with a flange. This is an example of a flangeless SPECT phantom. The ACR approved phantom is a cylinder with an internal diameter of 20.4 centimeters. The lower portion of the cylinder contains six sets of acrylic rods arranged in a pie-shaped pattern with diameters ranging from 4.8 to 12.7 millimeters. The upper section contains six solid spheres with diameters ranging from 9.5 to 31.8 millimeters. This diagram describes the phantom layout. This slide shows the uniformity section, sphere section, and rod section of the phantom. The ACR has also approved a data spectrum small spect phantom for cardiac cameras. The phantom is a cylinder with an internal diameter of 14 centimeters. It is flangeless. The lower portion of the phantom contains six sets of acrylic rods arranged in a pie-shaped pattern with diameters ranging from 4.8 to 12.7 millimeters. The upper section contains six solid spheres with diameters ranging from 6.4 to 25.4 millimeters. This is a picture of the data spectrum small spect phantom. Purchasing your phantom can be costly. The large deluxe flangeless spect phantom can be used for both spect and pet acquisitions. The JZAC deluxe flangeless ECT phantom can be used for spect only and the small SPECT phantom can be used on cardiac cameras.
Many sites choose to purchase their own SPECT Phantom. That way the technologist can image the Phantom and a physicist's services are only needed for interpretation. To position the ACR Phantom, it is placed on the patient bed, chair, or some sort of support so that it is positioned lengthwise corresponding to the primary patient axis. The phantom's long axis must be parallel to the z-axis of the detector system with the phantom level and the uniformity section should be head first into the camera. Phantoms with flanges may be required as extra support for leveling. The phantom should be positioned in the center of the field of view of the detector with the spheres placed in order of increasing size, clockwise as viewed from the top, when a clockwise acquisition will be performed. For a single detector camera, which is only capable of rotating 180 degrees, rather than a complete 360 degrees, special caution must be exercised in the orientation of the spheres. The phantom must be positioned so that the largest sphere is at the center of the 180 degree sweep for frame one. If testing with a dual head fixed 90 degrees detector configuration that only has a 180 degree acquisition arc, the largest sphere must be positioned in the center of the leading detector for frame one. Failure to follow these directions will produce images with poor contrast in the cold spheres. This is an example of a properly positioned phantom on the patient pallet. The ACR provides specific instructions for calculating the time per view. This is done to acquire approximately 32 million counts in the total SPECT study. If the system you are using shows the count rate prior to starting the SPECT acquisition, use the following procedure given below. If the count rate is not shown just prior to starting the SPECT study, acquire a planar acquisition for 10 seconds. You must be sure that the imaging table is not between the detector and the phantom. You divide by 10 to get the rate in counts per second. It is a simple calculation to obtain the time per view. Round up to the next whole number if the fraction of a second is greater than 0 0.5. Round the time down to the next whole number if the fraction of a second is less than 0 0.5. For acquiring the phantom, the ACR requests that you use the highest resolution, low energy, parallel hole collimator that is routinely used for clinical studies. Certain acquisition parameters should be adhered to. The total counts for SPECT acquisition for the sum of all images for all heads on multiple detector systems should not exceed 32 million counts. This is based on the counts in the first view. The count rate should not exceed 50 K counts per second. The use of a 128 by 128 matrix with either 120 or 128 views over 360 degrees is required by your imaging system if possible.
The radius of rotation should be as close as possible to 20 centimeters, and the center of the phantom must be as close to the axis of rotation, so that the distance from the face of the collimator to the phantom does not change significantly during the rotation. A 128 by 128 matrix with 120 or 128 views over 360 degrees is acquired. For an acquisition matrix of 128 by 128, the pixel size should be near 2.7 to 3.3 millimeters. Some systems will require an acquisition zoom factor, which can go up to a maximum of 1.6. This is used in order to achieve the appropriate pixel size required by the ACR. The phantom is reconstructed with a slice thickness between 0.6 to 0.9 centimeters. This is accomplished by summing two or three slices throughout the phantom. For most large field of view cameras, summing two slices will generate the appropriate thickness. Thickness, filter, and attenuation coefficient values must be entered into the parameter worksheets for submission. Most sites will reconstruct the entire phantom with filtered back projection and a Butterworth or a substitute filter. The ACR provides suggested parameters for the Butterworth filter. Parameter values can be adjusted to optimize contrast of the spheres and sharpness of the smallest visible rods in the transaxial slices. We use a software applied attenuation correction so that a profile across the phantom is essentially flat. For most cameras, the linear attenuation coefficient for technetium 99M is 0.11 to 0.12 centimeters. Use the uniform part of the phantom to define the boundary for attenuation correction. This is an example of the application of Chang's attenuation correction technique. This is an example of a transaxial slice of a JZAC phantom acquired before attenuation correction and then after the attenuation correction is applied. Transaxial slices are submitted with the appropriate slice thickness. A composite image of up to 12 summed images through the rod section must also be submitted. Individual images should be between 3 and 6 centimeters in diameter. Images are to be submitted in grayscale only. Linear mapping of the display is used with the lower threshold set at zero and an upper threshold set to maximum counts. Be sure to label hard copies with an ACR barcode and all pertinent imaging parameters. Digital submissions should also be appropriately labeled. The collimator construction can affect the quality of the contrast in the sphere section of the phantom. This is a slide showing different contrast achieved by different types of collimator construction. The most common artifact in phantom acquisitions is from non-uniformities. 
This will produce ring artifacts. This is an example of a slight ring artifact. This is an example of a severe ring artifact. Typical scanning protocols for the submitted clinical images will be required for accreditation. Your images should reflect the use of those protocols submitted. This chart reflects the images required for each module submitted to the ACR. The following should be permanently recorded on each image of the study. Patient name, patient age or date of birth, patient identification number, date of exam, and institution name. The technologist's name, initials, or other means of identifying the technologist who performed the study should also be indicated. The Nuclear Medicine Accreditation Committee has determined that all images for all submitted studies must be labeled for laterality and orientation. This requirement is necessary to reduce the number of serious treatment errors resulting from the lack of appropriate labeling and to address quality patient care issues raised by the recent focus on patient safety in medicine. We will now review ICANL accreditation. ICANL stands for Intersocietal Accreditation Commission Nuclear or PET. Most cardiology practices use ICANL for nuclear cardiology accreditation. ICANL is an organization comprised of representatives from an assortment of professional societies related to nuclear medicine and nuclear cardiology such as the ACC, ASNC, SNMMI, SNMMITS, and ASRT, as well as others. ICANL is focused on your lab as a whole, the overall quality of your lab, and your final report quality. They want to know that all aspects of your examinations are performed properly, and they want the exam procedure and results to be precisely documented in your final reports. ICANL requires you to maintain a policy and procedure manual that contains guidelines and protocols regarding the way you do just about everything. They want it to be sufficiently complete and detailed so that if all of your personnel were replaced tomorrow, new staff could pick up smoothly just from the policy and procedure manual. The intent of the ICANL accreditation process is twofold. It is designed to recognize facilities that provide quality nuclear medicine and pet services. It is also designed to be used as an educational tool to improve the overall quality of your facility. The following are the specific areas of nuclear cardiology for which accreditation may be obtained myocardial perfusion imaging, equilibrium radionuclide angiography, other cardiovascular imaging, and cardiac positron emission tomography.
The following are the specific areas of general nuclear medicine that ICANA will accredit. GI imaging, CNS imaging, endocrine imaging, and non-imaging, musculoskeletal imaging, GU imaging, pulmonary, infection and tumor imaging, lymphatic, therapy, and in vitro studies. The following standards reflect content changes that were made as part of the September 15, 2016 revision. These standards will become effective on March 15, 2017. Medical Director Medical directors must be a licensed physician and be an authorized user of radioisotopes according to NRC or state regulatory agency regulations. If the facility performs nuclear medicine therapies, the medical director must also be an authorized user for these procedures. The technical director. A qualified technical director is designated for the facility. The designated technical director must be a nuclear medicine technologist with the following qualifications. They must be credentialed in nuclear medicine technology. They must also be certified in life support. And their position of being a technical director must be full time. The staff. All members of the medical staff must be licensed physicians. Any physician authorizing the administration of radiopharmaceuticals must be an authorized user of radioisotopes according to the NRC or state regulatory agency regulations. All technical staff must be nuclear medicine technologists who have an appropriate credential in nuclear medicine technology. All personnel directly supervising stress procedures must have the appropriate training and experience. While physicians present during stress testing is not required, the facility must assure that appropriate staff is present, based upon the types of procedures being performed and the patient's risk of adverse events. Physicians and nuclear medicine technologists in training must not compromise patient care. All personnel who assist nuclear medicine technologists with direct patient care must have documented training, experience, and competency consistent with their duties. These duties must be acceptable under local, state, and federal laws and regulations. Ancillary personnel necessary for safe and effective patient care must be available. The facility should have written descriptions of the duties and responsibilities not outlined in the standards for each staff position. All members of the medical staff are encouraged to be authorized users of radioisotopes for the types of procedures they will be interpreting or performing. All personnel involved in direct patient care during all nuclear medicine and PET procedures should be certified in basic life support. The facility. ICANL requires that adequate facilities must be provided for all operations of the facility so that patient comfort, safety, dignity, and privacy are ensured, as well as staff comfort and safety. Areas must have sufficient space, be well maintained, and clean. This also includes meeting all federal, state, 
and local requirements regarding health, radiation, and occupational safety. Interpretation areas. Adequate space must be provided for interpretation of exam results and preparation of reports. The records. All patient records must be confidentially maintained and be retained. They must be accessible for the appropriate period of time as prescribed by state, institution, or other rules and regulations. Examinations must be interpreted and a final report provided by the medical director or qualified members of the medical staff. The final report must be typed or computer generated and must accurately reflect the content and results of the study. For nuclear cardiology studies, a standardized report is recommended. It is strongly recommended that raw digital image data be retained for a minimum of three years. If images are transmitted to another location for remote interpretation, a method of validating the quality of the transmitted images should be done to assure that it is of comparable diagnostic quality. For example, a SMPTE or similar pattern, which will be shown on the following screen. Although static images may be interpreted from film or other hard copy, it is preferable that they be interpreted on the computer. The description should use a standard nomenclature, such as the 17-segment cardiac model used for myocardial perfusion imaging. Reporting of normal values for left ventricular ejection fraction is strongly recommended. The final report should include a unique patient identifier, and, for nuclear cardiology studies, a standardized report is recommended. The American Society of Nuclear Cardiology Guidelines on Standardized Reporting is a good source for these standardized reports. This is what a typical SMPTE pattern looks like. Facility safety. Patient and employee safety is ensured by written protocols. Written protocols must be in place for initial and recurrent training, such as for HIPAA and OSHA, as required by local, state, or federal rules. There must be written protocols for radiation safety and radioactive materials handling. The Radiation Protection Program content and implementation must be reviewed at least annually. Equipment and instrumentation used in the nuclear medicine facility must be in good working condition and must be routinely inspected for safety and proper functionality and records kept on file. The facility must have acceptable site-specific written protocols for all routine quality control procedures of imaging and non-imaging equipment. Simply stating, following manufacturer's recommendations, is not sufficient. The facility must maintain records of all routine quality control of imaging and non-imaging equipment. Site-specific, detailed protocols must be documented and followed for routine inspection and testing of all imaging equipment. Protocols must be in accordance with all applicable federal, state, and local requirements. For gamma rays, planar, spect, and spect CT. 
they must be checked for energy peaking daily prior to use. Intrinsic or extrinsic uniformity calculations of integral and or differential uniformity values must be performed daily prior to use. Spatial resolution. Spatial linearity with a resolution phantom is performed weekly. Center of rotation is checked monthly. High count flood for uniformity correction is done per manufacturer's recommendation. Preventive maintenance must be done every six months. For SPECT CT equipment specifically, daily system checks are performed. What images should be submitted? For myocardial perfusion imaging, you must submit four complete RMPI studies. Cases are selected as follows. Only one study submitted may be normal. The other three must be abnormal. The abnormal studies can be the facility's choice. At least one of the studies must be an exercise stress study, and there must be at least one pharmacologic stress study. Images to be submitted can be on CD, DVD, or a flash drive. Cine of rest and stress rotating images to check for wall motion and overall quality. Cine of gated spect slices to view wall motion. Reconstructed stress rest slices, grayscale and in color. Calculated left ventricular ejection fraction and time volume curves. Gated spect slices in end diastole and end systole. Quantitative data, polar maps, etc. Documents can be uploaded directly into the application. EKG tracings, only rest and peak stress required. And then of course, your final report. Images to be submitted for equilibrium radionuclide angiography. Select four case studies from within one year prior to the date of submission. Only two ERNA cases will be required if the facility is seeking accreditation in an additional nuclear cardiology section. The studies may be normal or abnormal. Provide images and documentation of the LAO 45 degree, anterior, and left lateral views. You must submit a CINE of the views or submit screen captures of all three views. And left ventricular ejection fraction curves and the calculated EF included with your final report. If your facility performs other cardiovascular exams, a total of four other cardiovascular case studies are required. Only two other cardiovascular cases will be required if the facility is seeking accreditation in an additional nuclear cardiology section. Only one case may be normal. Cases must be selected from within one year prior to the date of submission. The general nuclear medicine case study submission requirements will be automatically calculated based on the information entered in the online application. All cases must be abnormal. A minimum of four, maximum of 12 cases will be required. If you are applying for one general nuclear medicine area, 
submit four cases for that specific area. However, if you are applying for more than one area, submit two cases for each type study for each area. If you are applying for one general nuclear medicine area, submit cases for that area in the following study types. Musculoskeletal, GI imaging, GU imaging, endocrine imaging and non-imaging, lymphatic or CNS, and therapy. If your imaging center has multiple sites, fixed and or mobile, select two abnormal contemporary cases of any imaging area in which the multiple site facility is applying. The two cases are in addition to the requirements for the primary site. Each case must include a sufficient number of images to support the final diagnosis along with the signed copy of the final report. A copy of any worksheets or preliminary reports should also be submitted. Cases must be selected from within one year prior to the date of submission. Please submit all images utilized in the interpretation of a study by a physician. Select sample cases from as many current medical and technical staff members who interpret or perform any nuclear medicine examinations in the facility. The medical director must be represented. Case selection is not camera dependent you may select cases from any camera in your facility. No more than one case per procedure type should be normal. All cases from multiple sites must be abnormal. Cases are to be contemporary, meaning they were performed with current personnel or on current equipment. Abnormal studies have positive findings or demonstrate pathology. For example, an MPI study with breast or subdiaphragmatic attenuation would not qualify as abnormal. Label all cases, including any discs or hard copies, with the following. The facility name, ID number, and site location. The patient name. The date of the study. And the type of the study. All materials submitted to the ACR or ICANL will be handled with strict confidentiality in accordance with HIPAA regulations. Here is a recap of the accreditation process. A joint commission survey is a challenging process for any healthcare provider, as it must examine its current processes, policies, and procedures relative to the current standards of care and prepare to improve any areas that are not currently in compliance. Accreditation is for the entire facility not any individual department through the Joint Commission. The ACR is highly focused on the quality of your cameras and images. They require the use of an imaging phantom, involvement by a medical physicist, and quality assurance studies about consistency of interpretation between interpreting physicians.
iCANEL is focused on your lab as a whole, the overall quality of your lab and your final report quality. They want to know that all aspects of your examinations are performed properly and they want the exam procedure and results to be precisely documented in your final reports. ICANEL requires you to maintain a policy and procedure manual that contains guidelines and protocols regarding the way you do everything. Which accreditation to use depends on your scope of practice. The trends are the following. Hospitals will get accredited through joint commission. Radiology labs have a tendency to use the American College of Radiology. And cardiology labs have a tendency to get accredited through ICANEL. Nuclear medicine departments may apply for accreditation from ACR or ICANEL. Joint commission accreditation must be done for an entire facility. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope you learned a lot from our webinar on accreditation in nuclear medicine. Please remember to take your test. There is no limit as to how many times you take it. Just be sure to score an 80% or above.